and get started. I'm really pleased to welcome Tian Tzu Ding today, who's going to be talking about um, the ecophysiology of intermediate wheatgrass. Um, Tian Tzu is originally from the Sichuan province in China. She received her BA at Hainan University in Marine Sciences, where she studied a small isopod that feeds on mangroves. Um, in that process, she realized she liked plants more than um, animals because they were a little bit easier to keep track of. And so she moved to do her MS degree in ecology, um, also on mangroves um, at Xiamen, Xiamen University. Um, and she came here to do her PhD. Um, and so I'm going to welcome Tian Tzu. Hi, everyone. Okay. Let me share my screen first. So, okay, let's get started. Hi, everyone. I'm Chen Su Ding. I'm a a second year PhD student in the program of applied plant science. And my advisor is Dr. Wanid Sedok. And my topic today is investigating the physiological basis of intermediate wheatgrass interannual yield decline. So my presentation is structured as follows. First, I will introduce the benefits of, the, of growing the intermediate wheatgrass and the main challenge for farmers to adopt the intermediate wheat grass, that is a yield decline, and introduce a approach for understanding yield decline, and also the objectives and hypothesis for my research questions. And I will cover the materials and methods I used for my research and give you a brief overview of the perennial preliminary results for the year one measurement. And finally, a short summary of what we have been able to conduct so far, as well as what I plan to do next. So given the green, greens make up over 70% of our global caloric consumption and over 70% of our global croplands, the impact and trade-offs between the perennial polycultures and annual monocultures on the environment and food production have been a um, major debate in the scientific community. That is to say, is the future of uh, agricultural perennial? That is the main research questions now. One of the most influential voices in this debate is from Dr. Wes Jackson. He, posed, he proposed to create a new agricultural by breeding perennial green crops, for example, the cereals and oil seeds. And he believes that by planting them in a complementary arrangements, agriculture could be transformed from a soil degrading activity to a soil building activity. And continued research have shown that it is achievable. Um, similar research is, is now undertaken at many institution, institutions around the world. As you can see here, each green circles indicate a university or a research institute working on develop diverse perennial green agroecosystems. There are around 40 institutions nesting, sorry, nesting here with much more in North America and Europe. But the data was collected four years ago, so probably more institutions are involved in working on perennial green agriculture now. And why exactly do people want perennial crops and what beneficial they can bring? I'm going to use one of the perennial crops, the intermediate wheatgrass, as an example to elaborate in more in detail. So the intermediate wheatgrass with the scientific name Sinophyrum intermediate is a newly domesticated carbon three cool season outcrossing perennial grass crop presenting a range, a, a range of promising environmental and social environmental benefits to cropping systems. The intermediate wheatgrass is a grass species related to wheat 
and if you have never never seen it before, the picture here shows what they look like. Originally, um, the intermediate wheat grass was introduced to the U.S. from Eastern Europe as a forage crop, and uh, in early 1930s. There has a long history of intermediate wheat grass improvement in Canada and Russia before 1983. And in 1983, as inspir uh, inspired and guidance by Dr. Lee West Jackson, Dr. West Jackson, um, the plant breeders and the Rodeo Institute selected the intermediate wheat grass as a promising perennial grain candidate. And beginning, uh, begin in 1988, researchers with the USDA and Zodell Institute undertook two cycles of selection for improve the fertility, the third si a seed size, and other traits in New York State. And in 2003, the NAND Institute's breeding program for intermediate began and multiple rounds of select, selecting based on their yield, seed size, disease resistance, and other traits have been performed since then. And in 1988, uh, 2018, uh, 2019, a cultivar of intermediate wheat grass called MN Clear Water was released by our university under the treat name Kenza. The intermediate wheat grass can grow throughout Western North America, and it needs a temperature between zero to 10 Celsius for six weeks in order to flower and produce grain. And it is adapted to area with, with low less than 13 inches of annual rainfall. Based on the experience, Intermediate wheat grass has a adaptability to grow in a wide range of environment. As follows to the Upsala, Sweden, and far south to the Salina, Kansas, US, as well as in the other hemisphere. And until now, we do not know the exact limit yet, but we believe it can be grown nearly the equator and higher elevations. The intermediate wheat grass can pro provide abundance of ecosystem service. It has a dense root system that can extend 10 feet or more, enhancing its carbon storage ability and water and nutrition uptake efficiency. Just give you a sense of how long their root system is. There is a comparison between the intermediate wheat grass root system with the uh, annual weight. And the intermediate wheat grass is a lead sink for atmospheric carbon. It absorbs up to 370 grams of carbon per square meters of the soil per year. And the roots of the intermediate wheat grass retain their carbon storage ability year round, benefits from the perennial nature. And it helps help reducing soil exhaustion, groundwater loose, and niching of nitrates. Planting intermediate wheat grass requires fewer inputs with a high biomass production and forage quality. That means they require less nitrogen fertilizer, less pesticide, and do not like the annual crop, which need to be replanted every year. The intermediate wheat grass require less seeds and tillage, thus contributing to the energy and economic cost savings. Other than the environmental and ecosystem benefits, the intermediate wheat grass could be used as both grain and forage. And it has attracted virus food industries, which is generating demand for higher production from farmers. Demand for Kenza, that is the commercial name of the intermediate wheat grass, started from one food company who developed the first Kenza beer, the Long Root L, brewed with 50% Kenza grain 
And people also use the Kenza for making bread and pasta. Here, the map shows the agro, uh, eagle graphic a geographic distribution of the intermediate wheat farmers. In 2019, an estimated around 500, uh, 500 acres was showing here seems that they are not widely adapted by farmer at that time but now let's have a look there are more than 100 farmers producing the intermediate wheat grass now and they were growing on around 4,000 acres in the united states and canada in 2021 however an interview with the U.S. Midwest farmers revealed that the yield is a key barrier for uh, to, to widespread farmers' acceptance of intermediate wheatgrass. And there is a farmer saying that the production of the intermediate wheatgrass is just too light compared to corn and soybeans. Uh, even the intermediate wheat grass has a lifespan of over 50 years. Usually, a large scale of grain yield decline are noticed and the, after the year two. The figure here shows a result of a recent meta analysis of all intermediate wheat grass um, in Minnesota over the last decades, conducted by our group. And it covers a total of 25 experiments and 3,423 plot level yield observations. The x axis here indicates the different age of the intermediate wheat grass, and the y axis indicates the grain yield they produce uh, on each year. And we found that the yield decline took place over the entire four-year window, with the strongest decline taking place between year one and year two. As reported here, just the yield decline between year one and year two averaged around 60%. 60, 60 and in some cases, it could be as severe as 90%. Given the many environmental benefits of the intermediate wheat grass I just mentioned, and from its perennialty, Managing this crop as an annual plant is clearly not a desirable outcome of the farmers. So here I want to introduce a framework raised by Graham in 1977. These 30 factors limiting the plant reproductivity. And these external factors could be classified into three categories. That is the stress the disturbance and the competition. As for stress, that is the uh, abiotic condition restricts the, per, uh, the product production. Um, it consists of the limitation in light, water, temperature, or mineral nutrients, as well as the exposition to growth inhibiting toxins or pollu pollutants. As for the disturbance, they are considered as a partial or total dis destruction of the plant biomass, raised, uh, raised by the her herbivores, fire or human activity. That is to say the trampling, the mowing and the plowing. plowing. As for the competition, the definition of this uh, word is the tendency of laboring plants to utilize the same quantum of light, the same ion of a mineral nutrient, and the molecular of water or volume of space. So taking this in considerate, the Graham used this triangle model to describe the virus equilibrium between the competition, the disturbance, and the stress in plant. Each axis indicated the relative importance of these external factors. And it's very interesting to compare the concept of the Grimm's strategy with those de derived from the previous attempt to identify strategies in plants 
that is the concept of the R selection and the K selection type. For the R selection type, which is made up of organisms with a short life expectancy and uh, large reproductive efforts. So when we take a look at the approximate distribution of the annual plant within the triangle model, they are located here with a relative higher importance of the disturbance while have a relative lower importance of the stress. That is co consistent with the annual um, properties. So as for the perennials, they are um, belongs to the case selection type too. And this type consists of uh, organisms in which the life expectancy of the individual is long and the properties of the energy and other captured resources devoted to reproduction is small. And the approximate distribution of the perennial herbs and ferns within the triangle model included the widest range of strategy. That means they have multiple paths of the strategy they can take. So this Grimm's theory is the root of our overarching hypothesis. That is, there is an interannual switch in strategy of this intermediate weight grass. As we already know, the, uh, the interannual yield decline happens in intermediate weight grass with the highest yield in year one and much lower yield uh, with the older ones. That because the year one stand unit have a higher risk of mortality in response to those three external factors, the competition, the distribution, and the stress. Whereas the plant once passed the seedling stage, the risk of mortality faced by year two and year older stands was greatly reduced. So we hypothesis that they will have different best strategy. For the younger plants, um, that is the year one plants, the best strategy for them is to have a fast growth and also a fast assimilate mobilization to seeds in order to escape the vulnerable stage. And for the older plant, their best strategy switch to a slower growth they tend to invest resources in reserves, defense, and stress tolerance. Based on our overarching hypothesis, we raised our first hypothesis. That is the interannual yield decline over the years in intermediate wheat grass, maybe in part driven by a progressive decrease in the ability of the crop to maintain the optimal gas exchange. That, uh, to say in detail, that is the um, younger plant will have a faster photosynthesis and a higher rate, rates of gas exchange, while the older one will have a slower photosynthesis with a lower rate of gas exchange. And the second hypothesis is uh, related to the photo assimilate remobilization dynamic difference. That is the younger plant will have a higher allocation of nitrogen and carbon compounds to seeds, while the older one will have a lower allocation of these compounds to seeds and uh, uh, compare with other things. And the third hypothesis is related to the stress tolerance, which we hypothesis that the younger plant will have a lower stress tolerance, while the older one will have a higher stress tolerance. Okay, to say in detail, our first hypothesis is that could yield decline be explained in part by a reduction in photosynthetic rates? Here are some evidence for our first hypothesis. The figure here shows the x-axis is the date they did the measurement, and the y-axis is the photosynthesis. They compare the um, different age of intermediate weight grass, the year one uh, stand and year one, uh, year two stand with their, to compare their photosynthesis with their 
annual weight relatives. And there is clearly um, a, a decrease in the photosynthesis in year two plant, uh, intermediate wheat grass when compared with the first, first year stands. And another um, experiment show, shows a similar trend. That is, uh, they compare, uh, in this case, they compare the different age of the intermediate wheat grass semester. That is the year one, year two, and year three plants, and trying to uh, investigate it. There, is there any difference for their photosynthesis? And they found that in April, there's no significant difference, but in May, there has a age related decrease in the photosynthesis. Um, but there's some issues with this existing evidence. First is that these data were collected on old or undomesticated genotype. That is to say there's one circle, uh, there's only one cycle of selection made on these varieties. So there might be a genotypic relevance. And also the only have few gas exchange measurements did on these two measurements. Typically, this kind of measurement will need to uh, artifact, artifactual results because the field condition is highly fluctuating. And also there might have some intrinsic ontogene dependent changes happen in the plant themselves. And also they leak the productivity data that is, the yield and component traits are unavailable for these two uh, experiments. Here, there's a diagram of the dependence of the seed yield formation on nutrient accumulation in the plant and photosynthetic production. And nowadays, we lack the evidence from the field study showing that the photosynthesis rates exert control over yield a green yield. And we also have some um, evidence for our second hypothesis. That is, could yield decline be explained in part by uh, unfavorable rates or timing of the remobilizations? Just as you can see here, the X axis indicate three different maze hybrid with different timing of the nesaring. That is the later senescence type, the intermediate senescence type, and the fast senescence type. And the y axis indicated their yield. As it should here, the early senescence needs to a uh, need to a lower nitrogen remobilization from vegetative tissues associated with a lower yield in maize. And our hypothesis is that. The intermediate weight grass is a perennial one, while the mass is an annual one. So it just gave us some inspirations on our second hypothesis. That is, might the intermediate the year one stand of the intermediate weight grass might have a, a late, later timing of senescence, while with the aging crest in there. Uh, in the intermediate weight grass, the timing of senescence just gets faster, earlier and earlier. And this hypothesis is unexploded in intermediate weight grass yet. And other than the age-related changes in intrinsic photosynthetic parameters, another puny examined possibility is that the yield decline could be related to an decline in rate silence to stressors, for example, the vapor pressure deficiency. That is VPD. So VPD is the difference between the amount of moisture in the air and how much moisture the air can hold when it is saturated. It is a main driver driver of the whole plant gas exchange, which follows the vapor pressure gradient. I use the figure here to give you a sense of how much the VPD virus across a day. 
it indicates the real environment of the intermediate wheat grass experienced last summer. As it shows here, the levels of the WPD increased by 4.5 fold. And from noon to 9 p.m., the intermediate wheat grass were continuously expo exposed to the stressful levels of the WPD. Um, and a meta analyze uh, here uh, shows that the uh, the vapor the VPD effect size for the trails related to the pelo A is the whole plant dry mass, the development and the architecture, and the paleo B is the yield and reproductive development. And it show revealed that the super optimal VPD reduce yield even under well-watered conditions. As you can see, they have elective VPD e effective on the yield. And this kind of elective VPD effects on yield is uh, medi me mediated by reduced stone metal conductance because the uh, transpiration response to VPD is differently related, uh, directly related to stomach sensitivity to increased VPD level. And the so increase, uh, increasing the VPD level could reduce stomach stomach closure. And this decline, the stomach conductance actually can have negative effect on the productivity that is strongest for long crop and perennial plants. Also, the increasing level of VPD could bring a negative impact on gas exchange too. As it, uh, the, the figure here shows the x-axis is the VPD level and the y-axis indicates the late photosynthesis. And the solid circle indicate the previous year, year's leaves and the uh, light, light gray triangle is the current year leaves. From the figure here, um, the pre previous year's, a year leaves exhibits higher reduction of photosynthesis in response to VPD related to the leaves forms in current years. And I use this example here just to give us uh, insp ins inspiration on um, there might have also be an age-related decline in resilience to stressors of the uh, inter intermediate weight grass. And this kind of gas exchange response to VPD alone or in interaction with the stand age are not known in intermediate weight grass now. So for um, in order to answer these three hypotheses, uh, I will use the following material and methods to do my measurements. So here, uh, this is the location of where my field located on. The, the, the salt date, sowing date of the intermediate wheat grass was on September 2020. And this experimental design is a randomized complete block with split plot, plot arrangement with a random assignment of four nitrogen fertilizer, which is 0, 50, 100, and 150 kilometer per hour. And our measurement will focus on the family, uh, the, the populations exposed to the 50 kilometer uh, uh, a kilogram per hour treatment, which is a standard recommend fertilizer fertilization rate. Six of 76 hop safe intermediate wheat grass population were used, which are being developed as part of the commercial variety MN clear water. I will explain more why we only choose six populations here. Just give you a sense of the perennial the perennial grow for many years and urinary products uh, each year. 
And what makes the plants perennial are their underground reproductive organs or rhizome, which lives from year to year and produce new top growth annually. annually. And they experiment some different stages. And what I do is whenever I went into the field, I took the picture and have some record of their uh, phenology data, as it showed here. The plants are uh, on different stage and at different times. And also collect the environmental data from the sample weather station and the machine I will use, uh, I used itself. And also collect the leaf blades for uh, measure the leaf nitrogen content and also the specific leaf area and leaf autonomy data. I use the uh, LICO 16800 to conduct my gas exchange dynamics measurement and the gas exchange response curves. Just give you a sense how the machine looks here. That is the LICO 16800, which is a long destructive knee probe process involved in the real-time photosynthesis. First, the machine measure up measures the uptake of carbon dioxide and the release of the water by a sample with a high precision in fired gas analyzer. And using the, uh, as you can see here, this is the chamber of the Nyko and the panel will sh show the different parameters uh, at the real time. Let's take a detailed look on these parameters. The, and after, after they take the measurement of the carbon dioxide and water, the, uh, they will use, uh, it will use a mass balance approach based on the input and output of these two uh, from the sample covert and the uh, machine will comp compute the late carbon dioxide assimilation that is the photosynthesis and the transpiration. Also, for a leaf level measurement, additional measured parameters include the leaf temperature will allow the instrument to calculate other physiological parameters, including the photo, uh, the stomatal conductance and the intracellular carbon dioxide concentrations. So here is the timeline for my high frequency gas exchange measurement. I started from the uh, very beginning of May until the June 20th uh, in a total of 15 times. And the last measurement was conducted uh, seven, seven days before the harvest. The green box here just give you a sense this day, these days I did the measurement and the blue bar uh, indicate from when to when uh, the flowers, uh, the intermediate wheat grass are in which stage. Just here the, from the May 12th to June 4th, the intermediate wheat grass was on the sturm inundation stage. And after that, they are in the flowering stage. And these are the three parameters I uh, pay more, uh, pay, pay attention. I focused on this high frequency gas change meters. Oh, that is the stomach conductance, the transpiration, and the photosynthetic rates. And here is the chamber condition for the for the ex, um, for the gas exchange measurement. And as I uh, give you a sense how much time it needed for the six intermediate weight grass population. So here I, I will uh, I conduct the experiment on six populations with three ribs, and each ribs will have two leaves be measured. So it's uh, a total of 60, uh, 36 measurements were conducted each time and you need to take around five minutes per measurement in total, the three hour, around three hours are needed. And this is not including the times for the warm up the machine. So it's reason, reasonable, six population is our highest 
number we can did or we can do the measurement. And here is the gas. Uh, I did the gas exchange response curves. To, so also, uh, I did them these curves on three consecutive sunny days in the field in May, June, and July. And these are the parameters I just mentioned. For, uh, I also focus on them for the gas exchange response curves and to say these, uh, how they're in response to the PAR, that is the photosynthetically active radiation and to the carbon dioxide and to the VPD. These are the um, chamber condition for measuring the times. As you can see here, uh, for the, for example, for the PAR curve, I only say different values are uh, point for the PAR and the other uh, parameters will stay the same. And the exposure time for each level of the different uh, response curve is 15 minutes for each point for the PAR and carbon dioxide response curve and 30 minutes for the VPD response curve. Just give you a sense each curve, the time needed for each curve is listing here. And usually we will do three curves per day. Also, we will collect the yield and yield component traits, including the green yield, the biomass yield, the harvest index, the total tenor number per meter, and the number of spike per meter. Also, the tenor best mass, the seed mass per spike, the seed number per spike, as well as uh, individual seed weight. So before I jump into, uh, give you the, uh, uh, before I introduced my results, what I want to emphasize is that our results are based on the year one data only. So technically we cannot present the, uh, just to come present re result because we still need, need the data from year two and year three. And, just for all, uh, just combine the year one, year two, year three data can only give us uh, answers to our hypothesis. I just need the year one result here to give us a confidence and also a variability of our measurement. So for our first hypothesis, does photosynthesis efficiency and capacity change in an age-dependent manner in the intermediate wheat grass? I use a figure here to show uh, the response curve of the photosynthesis to the PAR. As it indicated here, the vertical line is the photosynthetic capacity. At the, this line is the photosynthetic efficiency. The photosynthetic capacity is a measure of the maximum rate of uh, which level of leaves are able to fix carbon during photosynthesis. And the photosynthetic efficiency is the fraction of the light energy converted into chemical energy during the photosynthesis. And let's have a look uh, on how these response curves change following the time courses. So here show the pink one shows the June measurement and black one shows the uh, July measurement. So clearly the data indicate a leaf age dependent decline in those key photosynthetic parameters. And this is consistent with the self-destruction hypothesis. That is the remobilization of the nitrogen rich products for example, the Rubik's core from the leaves to the seeds. Rubik's core is the key enzyme involved in the photosynthetic carbon fixing, fix, fixation, and the Rubik's protein is the most abundant protein in the leaves. Units make up 50% of the total leaf protein content. And there are still many parameters could be extracted from this figure. Uh, 
as I already introduced the photosynthetic efficiency and the capacity and uh, the data can be extracted includes the apparent quantum yield and the daytime dark respirations, for example, and we're still in the progress of this uh, extracting them. So to our second hypothesis, can gas change time courses describe the remobilization dynamics? So here, the plot show the x axis show, shows the total uh, the, the 15 times high frequency gas exchange measurements, and the y axis indicates either the power, the temperature, and the VPD. These data are collected from the sample weather station as well as the light core itself. As it, as you can see here, you only wait. We did some measurement, um, or our measurement um, are were made on sunny days with saturating power. That is, the power is uh, greater than the 500 Wimo, um, per square meter per second. And from the uh, temperature and WPD data, it it clearly shows there is a variation in weather across the seasons. There is just a large variation in temperature uh, uh, from the 12 to 34 Celsius, and so WPD were also changed from the uh, were also changed from the 0.4 to 3.8 kPa during the uh, across the seasons. And let's look at the gas exchange parameters. As shown here, uh, the x axis is uh, just following, it continues to uh, the above figure. The x axis is still the uh, date we did the measurement, and the y axis. This one is for the stomat conductance, and this one is the transpiration, and the last one is photosynthesis rate. As we can see, the vegetative phase, that is the elongation, the storm elongation phase, the photosynthesis is uh, relatively stable, but the gas exchange, uh, the other gas exchange parameter, the stoma conductance and the transpirations fluctu fluctuating a lot. That is might due to the um, VPD and temperature variation. Just when we compare them, it's easy to conduct this. And well, uh, when we have a look on, on the reproductive phase, it's just the, flo uh, the flowering stage. The temperature and VPD virus a lot, but the decrease in the stomach conductance and the transpiration as well as the photosynthesis is stable, just to say have a, a stable in a decrease over the time that indicate this kind of decrease is likely intrinsic. And also it is probably due to the remobilization of nitrogen and carbon compounds from senescent leaves to the seeds. In order to determine the leaf nitrogen status during these gas exchange meter, uh, uh, measurements, leaf blades from two population, I list here, just were sampled every week from June 11th to July 20th in a total of seven times. And I plot the photosynthetic and the leaf nitrogen content in a um, in same temporal resolution to say if there has a link between them. As it indicates from the plot, the decline in photosynthesis is mirrored by that of the nitrogen in the leaves, which can uh, give us a confirmation of the remobilization of nitrogen-rich rich photosynthetic enzymes. And also it gave us confidence to say that we are able to track the remobilization dynamics using the gas exchange. So, what conclusions we can get, uh, we can conduct so far, and what I'm going to do next, I will introduce them. So, again, 
these are partial conclusions. We, we, because we only have the year one data, we still need the year two and year three data to confirm. So to say, first, the photosynthetic efficiency and capacity vary in a leaf age dependent manner. And also the high frequency gas exchange time courses could be used for tracking, tracking the remobilization dynamics and also to detect detects the genotypic difference, even within a uniform gen genetic background. And the remobilization dynamics confirmed by, uh, is confirmed by destructive nitrogen measurement, as I just showed in the figure. And what I plan to do next is to replicate the same physiological measurement on year two and year three. And that will happen sooner, just at the end of this month and conduct the microscope and image analyze measurements to extract stomatal and vascular autonomy data for better interpret the gas change data. And I will gas, uh, gather the yield and yield component data to analyze them with, in relation with the gas exchange parameters. And this will provide, uh, this kind of data will provide it by the help of the Junger's lab and do the analysis of gas exchange response curves to the uh, vary of WPD level and use the database to evaluate environmental effects on yield decline. And finally, I'd like to thank my advisor, Vanit, and the members in our lab, Jose, Xiaoxing, Daniel, and Robert, and also thanks my committee member, Dr. Nancy, Dr. G Jack, Dr. Jim, and also the Minnesota Department of Agriculture for Evergreen Initiative for funding my research. Thank you, and I would appreciate um, any questions, comments, and suggestions. Okay, the question is that uh, did I did the measurement each time on the same leaf or the uh, newly emerged leaf? Um, that is, I did the measurement on a few new. Few, just fully expanded uh, leaf each time because as the time cross the leaves I did the maybe the first or second measurement just died or get older. I just I want to uh, do the measurement on the healthy deep green leaf. Uh, Mm. So I was wondering why you only use two for the first cycle for your Ah, that is, that is, uh, yeah, the question is that why we only focus on the family, the populations exposed to the 50 kilometer um, uh, treatment. The, that is to say this one is a standard recommended fertilization rate. And also if we choose different rates of the uh, nitrogen treatment, considering them in, in my, uh, my measurement, that is, there's no way I can date the six population. Just it will increase the time uh, needed for the measurement and also will reduce the population, I can conduct the measurements. Thank you for that question. Um, I don't know much about LiveSAR at all. So like, how is the, um, like the repeatability of this machine in the field? Like, does it have good repeat? I'm assuming it has good repeatability. I just, yeah, if you could expand on that a little bit. Um, just could you please? Yeah. Um, so how 
I guess how sensitive is the light farm machine to the environment, right? Like if it's a sunny day, if it's like a cold or windy day, I guess so photosynthetic light would also be sensitive to that. But like if you measure at the same plant mm. three times, mm. would you get the same weight each time? Oh, okay. The question is that is a uh, light coal or uh, repeatable machine itself. The thing is uh, just every time, even you are under the same condition, the LICO will give you the real time photosynthesis reading. That means you are not going to have the exactly same uh, rate, rate out each time. Okay. They will change just based on the environment itself. So, um, there is a question from Emily says that is photosynthesis partitioned differently among the plant organ, the roots, stems, leaves, seeds, as the plant age from year one to two and beyond. Okay, let me think for a few seconds. Yes, from the research, uh, it's so just I I'm not quite um, um quite sure if there's a age dependent difference for the photosynthetic partition, but they they do have a different uh locate allocation to different plant organs, but and. I don't know if this answers your questions, but that is what uh, what came to my mind now. And there's another question from Dominic. Uh, are you finding an uh, associated between tinering rate and yield change over time? Hmm. I, I think these questions uh, will be answered maybe next week by Alex, I am not uh, conduct this. Uh, I'm I'm not have uh, just do the research on the tuning rate difference to the yield change. But uh, to my knowledge now, I think there might be an association between them. Thanks for these questions. changing in strategy from year one to year two. Um, I know you might not collect this data, but um, what do you expect might happen in year three or year four under this um, life strategy survival plan? Just from uh, the question is that um, the switch of the strategy for different ages of a plant, what we expect for the uh, year three and year four or older plant. As I proposed here, we expected that we, we don't only do the exp uh, hypothesis on the year two plant only, we just hypo do an overall hypothesis for older plant. That means it includes the year two plant and as well as the older plant. Does that make sense to your question? Okay. Yeah. Last year was prior year. How did your Okay, thanks for the question. The question is that the last year, year year's weather is very drought. And did we compare the yield um, to the previous study? The answer is that we didn't analyze the yield yet. So we still need to uh, have a look on that. And also to uh, considering the drought condition happened last year. So this year we will not only have the experiment on the year one plant on the same plot, we will also include a larger trail. 
uh, with the newly planted uh, plant indicating the new year one plant. Is there any other questions? You can type or just unmute yourself. Okay, thanks for your listening. And I pre appreciate your time and your uh, every questions. I really appreciate. Sorry, eight. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Okay, just the green box here indicate the uh, each time I did the measurements, and I know they might be not easy to see what uh inside. Just the date, for example, this is the May first. I did the first uh, measurement and uh, the very last one is June 20th. I did the last measurement and that happens seven days prior to the harvest date. Thank you. I, I always forgot to thanks first when people <laughs> write questions and thought about it. Oh, I forgot again. <laughs> so your data shows that these plants uh, are good for respiratory therapy sickness and uh, summer weather. Mm -hmm. These plants exhibit a summer dormancy. Is that what you would expect? Um, or are these plants growing vigorously throughout the whole summer? Uh, Actually, to that question, um, what I noticed last year is that when approaching to the harvest date, the plants are already, uh, the, the greenness is was banished. They are totally yellow. And what happened last year is because of the extreme, extremely drought condition, the plant from the tip of the leaf, they turn to yellow, even at the maybe middle of the June. And, the, and that time it's still one week, uh, one, one month until the, the harvest ha happened. The thing is, and I also noticed the leaf area just sh sh shrink. I, I don't know because it's the uh, first year. I, I should compare their fin just phenomenon to maybe this year we could have different observations. And my second question is, um, so this interview was applying only observe across development and the seedling to the first year. What if you transplanted to the small clump and you divided the plant and let it regrow? Is this interview going to apply also observe this? Honest, no, no, sorry. No, <laughs> Another question. You said you looked at um, two leaves each time you did this and you did a newly growing, newly emerging and growing leaves, right? So are they um, are these leaves from the same pillar or the main stem, or did you just pick two leaves?
leaves that look kind of like they look similar to the other leaves you picked, and how did then how did you kind of developmentally stage these leaves so that you knew that you were going to be picking the same sort of age group in each case? Okay, one thing I forgot to mention is that I only did the measurement on the reproductive tenors. So I choose from the uh, the leaves from the reproductive tenors because they have some, a, a lot of vegetative tenors. I only choose from the vegetative or uh, reproductive tenors and that not not the just newly emerged, fully expanded leaf is the third one from the top. Okay. So that and I choose the uh, uh, the leaves have the similar appearance and also the um, greenness to keep the concepts to, to cons just based on this standard to do the fifteen times of measurement. So you said something about leaf and average. Mm. You said you're going to measure that, but I'm not sure what you're going to measure that. Are you going to measure in biology or what does that mean? How we, what does that mean? Leaf autonomy. Actually collect leaf anatomy data. Okay, thank you for that question. The leaf anatomy data I'm going to uh, collect is uh, stomatal con con uh, density on both. Um, how are you going to do that? Uh, use a micro crop. I uh, just I already sampled the leaves uh -huh. and store them in the arsenal. Okay. And I'm going to just put some sub samples from the leaf and uh, do the. Yeah. Yes. So the other thing I was wondering about is. You kind of said this as a response to someone's question. Mm. I'm wondering why you didn't just set the experiment up to begin with that first, second, and third year of science, all in the same trial at the same time. Because it wasn't available, or? Yeah, now it's more than, uh, uh, isn't available, but maybe I think for the third year, I will have the year three plant, year two plant, and year one plant. And those are all, so you're going to cut down some of this trial and then replant first year plants? Or are you plants like in the next? So for, the answer is, well, we planted them last fall, but the second year plants. Yeah, yes. Okay. Um, or someone planted them. Yeah, for, for the plot I showed in the slide, that is the first year plant. Uh, uh, that is planted on 2020. And yeah. in this year, that is considered as the year two plan. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of fields. I still don't know where it is. I uh, will ask and Jack. So it's not the same place. Though. Yeah, not it's same not place. Really, you can't replicate it. Okay. All right. Yes. Okay. So here is a question right from Emily. Given that the roots are perennial, are you looking at the root? Are you looking at root systems at all? If there is winter damage to the root system, the second year yield could decline due to the environmental factor. Um, the answer to this question is that I don't look at the root system. I only focus on the above, above ground measurements. And so, so can I follow think, up? Yeah, I, I, actually, I actually can talk. I can. Yeah, I can hear you now. Sorry, I can't hear anything. And it needs to get through the winter time. So, so the I can hear you. You can't hear me. You can. Yeah. No, no, I can't hear. Just uh huh. So, so if you can. So, so I'm, I'm surprised that you're not paying attention to the root system because if it gets damaged or you have a, a smaller root system, you're going to have a huge impact on yield. So, so is somebody looking at root survival of intermediate wheatgrass? Because I would think that these these would have a huge impact on it. 
Yeah, I, I thought, uh, I don't know, is there anybody are going to look at this? Yeah, I'm going to Oh, okay. Alex will look at that. <laughs> <laughs> well, both of these questions have been like, yeah, sometimes yeah. I wonder if maybe like what it would have been like if you and I just did work on the same plan, you know, because like each yeah. of the things we do is yeah. So much for one person. Yes. It might have been nice, but. <laughs> <laughs> so for your questions, I think Alex will answer next week. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the questions. I have a question about, so you know, we talked about the maze experiment and the. Mm. Mm. We don't need to go back to that. Um, okay. And I'm just wondering about. Has anyone actually done the experiment that you just showed in terms of the photosynthetic efficiency and capacity in an age, leaf age sort of dependent way in a perennial plant? I tried to figure that out, but I maybe I, maybe I lost, but I don't see any. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, maybe there have. So if I found them, they were, I will use them. Okay. that yeah. Yeah, example. I, I yeah. figured you'd use that, but I'm just wondering, yeah. it's kind of odd that no one has done that. And what they usually do is for the not for the perennial crop, the the focus on the age related difference of the photosynthetic uh, capacity and efficiency. But they usually do is on to do the measurement on the same year to compare the older leaves and the uh, new leaves. And for the intermediate wheat grass, they will have some. They will have the new leaves each year, so we just cannot compare that. Have you looked at the odd in regards to? Uh, All right, so any, any other questions? Go ahead. Uh, I guess Yeah. I found it on the Yeah, I got the suggestion to only show the lower part of the panel, but I still have another meeting with Bonit and this. Okay. Yeah. I have another question. I'm still thinking about the nitrogen treatment. Mm. So, is anyone going to do any type of measurements comparing the different rates of nitrogen? Because one of the things that you're also studying is nitrogen. Nitrogen is very important for the kernel crop products. And in, in my, the way I'm thinking, nitrogen might have a huge influence in maybe like green yield or, you know, uh, sensing yeah. or even because nitrogen is very important for leaf extension and lots of things. So what I'm thinking is that is it is anyone going to do any type of measurement uh, comparing the different, different rate, uh, rates of nitrogen? Because I think nitrogen could have, because what I'm thinking is, okay, yeah. what if I could solve the problems of yield decline just by applying nitrogen in an older plant? Yeah, you know? actually, and I think, think yeah. Nitrogen, okay, if you want to, for example, we produce a lot of rice in Brazil, sometimes mm. we harvest the rice, and those plants, they branch out, we apply nitrogen, and they produce again. So I'm thinking maybe, you know, maybe your older plant, if you just apply nitrogen, it will still produce high yields. Yeah. So, Okay, thanks for that question. Actually, I did the measurement to compare the nitrogen between the 
zero, fifty, and one hundred oh. also last year, but I didn't present here is too much for oh. the presentation. But the thing is that I did the amendment maybe since the late May to the the time uh, until harvest. And when I compare the data I got, there seems no relationship between the uh, just there's no significant difference between different nitrogen on the photosynthesis param parameters. That is what I get. So you only evaluate uh, nitrogen rate and photosynthetic rate, uh, no granular evaluation, right? Uh, you're, collecting, you're collecting yield data on four nitrogen treatments, right? I only collecting yield data from the 50 one but i think the you you have the whole um nitrogen treatment data for the there I, one. yeah yeah the, many yes i was just curious in this in this field are is somebody like there is okay so, okay so this is my suggestion maybe for you or for whoever's going to analyze it just at the end you don't really for example if i was a soybean farmer I wouldn't care about you know photosynthetic rate. I would care about grain yield. Yeah. So if you could compare the nitrogen rates and grain yield, I think that would be very nice to show them. If if you are going to do it, if not, it's yeah, that's a very good suggestion. I will just have have a talk with Jack if you have the different nitrogen yield data. It would be good to do it as a parent. They have done other experiments. Yeah. Because like if this, you compare, you know, find, yeah. grain yield decline still happens even if. Even if you prefer, okay. Maybe, maybe, you know, it's not that it's not important, but there's clearly other things going on. Like, mm -hmm. maybe for, for, yeah. or we for some of the like, planting density and stuff like that. Yeah. Here's a uh, other question from Emily. Have you looked at the turf grass literature in regards to yield, yield reduction? Uh, I think I have a, not a very deep dig in these literatures, but I do have some papers for, for the yield of the turf grass. I should, I should compare if they have the same trend of the interannual yield decline. And thanks for that question. They do. They have exactly the same issue in the turf grass breeding program. And, okay. and so you might want to talk, that's what Dominic Christensen was asking that question. And Eric Watkins is the, um, is the turf grass breeder. And you might want to talk to Eric about it, you know, as well, because it really is, a, it's a phenomenon we see in horticultural crops and perennial plants all the time, where a yield goes down oftentimes once the plant becomes established. So that was kind of more because they think more of more of the partition photosynthates are going into the root system. So good thing to think about. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. So any comments about the presentation? I will approve the presentation. You did really good. I saw your first um, sort of set of slides that they set up and they got out of your presentation that I think it's really necessary to uh, your presentation. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Today, when I work on the best we can do, seeing the errors seem like there are so many results that we want to get over that I hope that I kind of follow what is for that feeling. So I think it's doing that work. Thank you. And thanks for just everybody's suggestion for the driver. And I thought to end the um, comparison between the perennial and print or uh, annual and the very first slide. But when you said no, <laughs> so I just use the intermediate wheat grass to as an example to uh, to show the ecosystem surveys of the perennial crop because they just have the similar um, advantages. Thanks. Good job. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>